One of the most common criticisms that I see of Apple products is that they're great if you're involved in the ecosystem, but it's just too expensive to get involved on all these different platforms. In today's video, we're gonna challenge that. Can we get into Apple's three major platforms, iOS, macOS, and now iPadOS, for just $500? Today's video is sponsored by Hostinger, a powerful web hosting service that allows you to register, build, and host your website all in one place. Check out the link in the description below with code LUKEMIANI to get 15% off your order on Hostinger today, and I'll have more information at the end of the video. So, $500, three distinct platforms. Is that even possible? Well, I'm gonna add another requirement to make it even harder. Not only are we going to have to get an iPad, iPhone, and a MacBook for $500 combined, all of the devices that I order have to be natively supported under the current version of their operating system. So with the challenge set, I decided the first place to start would be the MacBook, since that's likely going to be the most expensive component here. I figured the best option would be to go for a unibody MacBook Pro from mid-2012, as a Retina is almost always going to blow our budget wide open, and the mid-2012 is a good value with solid upgradability. I ended up purchasing this bone stock 2012 base model for $200. You may remember it from my last video. As I discovered in that same video, the original 5400 RPM drive was failing miserably, so the seller gave me back $25 to cover the cost of replacement. With that money, I bought a cheap 240 gigabyte solid state drive and picked up 8 gigabytes of RAM on eBay for $20 shipped bringing the total cost of my MacBook Pro to $220. So now that we have a MacBook that can handle our Mac OS tasks, we need an iPhone that is good enough to be relied on every day, but cheap enough to make this experiment possible. I wanted to leave $150 left for an iPad, so I set myself a budget of 130 bucks and ended up buying this iPhone 6S for exactly $130. It ended up being rose gold, which was a bit of a surprise to me, but it's in absolutely flawless condition and its battery is at 96% of its original capacity. Also, it has 64 gigabytes, so storage space isn't as huge a concern as if it were something like 16 or 32 gigs. At this point, we only have $150 left to spend on an iPad, and that's where this experiment gets a little bit tricky. The oldest iPad to support iPadOS is the iPad Air 2, which should be fine for our basic purposes, but most of the units that I found for less than $150 had only 16 gigabytes of storage, which is definitely not gonna cut it. After a bit of hunting, I settled on this Space Gray 64 gigabyte model that I negotiated for $155. So my total for all three of these devices came to $505. I'm not too concerned about the extra $5 over my original budget, and frankly, I'm impressed that this is even possible to begin with. So at this point, the big question is, with these three very inexpensive devices, is it actually worthwhile? How well do they run? And honestly, I'm completely blown away by how successful this was. We'll start with the MacBook. This guy is running a dual-core i5-3210M at 2.5 gigahertz, and while no one would claim that it's fast, it's plenty adequate for web browsing, document typing, light photo editing, and the like. What really helps us out here is the solid state drive and upgraded 8 gigabytes of RAM. Web browsing and general OS navigation is a lot smoother thanks to these $45 upgrades, and I highly recommend them to anyone who owns one of these older unibody MacBooks. In fact, the only thing that detracts from the experience at all would have to be the display. 1280 by 800 on a 13.3 inch panel is definitely a little bit low res and can be a little tricky to use, especially if you've gotten used to the high res panels that are so common on today's devices. The iPhone 6S is surprisingly snappy considering its age. Four years is an eternity in smartphone years, but the 6S is a robust device and it shrugs off its years casually. It's not without its signs of age, mind you. Animations can stutter or drop a frame here and there, 
and it becomes clear fairly quickly that background apps have to reload often. I've also noticed that because the A9 chip has to work pretty hard to keep up, the device can get warm if you're switching apps a lot over an extended period of time. I'd have to say the biggest drawback is the battery life. I found it a little bit tricky to get through a full day with the battery on this device, even if I'm running in low power mode. And keep in mind, the battery on this guy is at 96% of its original capacity, so if you have something that's a little bit more used, a little bit more worn, with more cycles on the battery, it might actually be less than this. The iPad suffers from similar drawbacks with its A8X processor. When downloading apps in the background and switching between programs relatively quickly, the pad can warm up noticeably. Battery life, on the other hand, is very solid, around eight hours or so. And despite the more fully featured OS, I really didn't feel tied down by the older hardware. Animations feel snappy and multitasking really wasn't an issue. So on their own, all of these devices operate surprisingly smooth, considering that the iPhone is four years old, the iPad is five years old, and the MacBook is seven years old. You'd expect them to show their age a little bit more, but Frankly, apart from the battery life on the iPhone and the display and thickness of the MacBook, you really couldn't tell. But what makes this experiment so much more interesting is the integration between all of these three platforms. I think my favorite feature that the Apple ecosystem offers is handoff. If I find a website on the iPhone that I want to explore on a larger display, I can seamlessly hand over to the MacBook and pick up right where I left off. If I take a picture on the iPhone, it shows up right away on the iPad and on the Photos app in the MacBook. If I start working on a video script on the MacBook Pro and decide I want to swap over to Pages on the iPad, it's right there and waiting for me. Likewise, iMessage is a treat when you're integrated like this. They sync across all devices and even dreaded green bubbles aren't left out thanks to text message forwarding on the iPhone. I think this is what makes Apple so interesting to examine. Each of these devices on their own can be useful tools, but it's when they operate in harmony that you get a glimpse of what is intended from the Apple ecosystem. I think the biggest surprise of this experiment was how usable the iPad is. I was a little bit on the fence about using a five-year-old iPad with an A8X processor, but iPadOS is surprisingly well optimized. I personally haven't owned an iPad in a good few years, I had the original iPad mini back when it came out in 2012, and I enjoyed it for several years, but until recently, iPads just weren't that useful, honestly. They were kind of like giant iPod touches back in the day, but now that the iPad has its own OS and much more powerful multitasking and application support, things have changed a lot. It still surprises me how fully featured this five-year-old tablet feels. Split screen and multitasking work perfectly well despite the older hardware and they haven't had a huge impact on the battery life of the device. In fact, the only feature that I wasn't able to get running is Sidecar in macOS Catalina. It appears that you need to have a more recent Mac, although reports are conflicting as to which ones are actually supported. I did come across a terminal command that acts as a workaround, but I wasn't able to get it working on my 2012 MacBook Pro, so you might have some success if you have something more recent like 2013 to 2015. But apart from that, honestly, everything that you would want to do on these devices works as advertised, and I'm really, really impressed with how successful this experiment was. I was a little bit nervous that I would wind up with like a Core 2 Duo MacBook, an iPad Air first generation from like 2013, and like an iPhone 5S, but much to my surprise, these are not only fully featured, but fully supported devices. That's insane. In the last few years, Apple has been hiking their prices and making it harder to break into that ecosystem. But hopefully with this experiment, I've demonstrated that even if you're on a tighter budget, you can still get into this ecosystem. If you take your time and hunt for deals, anything is possible. Fortunately, if it's a deal for web hosting that you're looking for, you can stop looking now because Hostinger, today's video sponsor, is here to help. Hostinger is one of the best places to register, build, and host a high quality website for a low price all in one place. They have an insane amount of useful tools and plugins that make setting up a great custom website super easy. They've got SEO tools, cache management, and easy to use file management. Hostinger also allows you to set up and manage a business email all right from this one centralized platform. 
In fact, when I was going to register a domain with Hostinger so that I could try out their account, I actually found out that someone has already registered the domain lukamiani.com and wow, it is a really high quality and well-designed website. Hostinger has a crazy amount of features and services all bundled together, so make sure to head over to the link in the description and use coupon code LUKEMIANI to get 15% off your order today. So with that, I'd like to thank you guys so much for watching this video. As usual, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Please consider following me on Twitter, at LukeMiani, and definitely consider joining my subreddit. All of that stuff is linked in the description below, and with that, I'll see you all in the next video.